I'm talking about straining for that logo on the side of your helmet and not the name on your back. Yes, sir. Because we know what it represents. It represents everybody here you see and everybody you can't that we've talked about. I'm here to strain with you, men. I swear to God I'm here to strain with you. Let's go. Everything you got, strain with everything you got. Let's go. Let's go. Bills on three. One, two, three. Bills. You're listening to the Off Tackle with John Fita Show with your host, Joe Miller. Well, what is going on, everybody? Welcome. Welcome, everybody, into the Off Tackle with John Fina Show, brought to you by the Market Dominator team on the Buffalo Rumblings Vidcast Network, presented by Picasso's Pizza. Treat yourself to the most flavorful pizza on game day. Picasso's, we are Buffalo Pizza, shipping local and nationwide. Order online at picassospizza.net. I am the host of this year Off Tackle with John Fina Show. My name is Joe Miller. You can find me on Twitter at Joe Miller Wired and sitting right beside me right there is the star of the show, former offensive tackle for the Buffalo Bills, the one and the only, maybe, John Fina. Happy Victory Monday. Monday. <laughs> Your shirt? I, fi- I finally got my shirt from 26 shirts, man. I've been, <laughs> you know, there there only come so many extra smalls. You have to wait and wait until yeah. they refill the extra smalls. I got mine skin tight. Yeah. Oh, yeah. J- John Fina and his schmediums. Six yeah, that's foot five. Right, John- baby. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> his schmediums. Uh, yeah. So it is uh, good to see you. But uh, we uh, have a really good show for you. We appreciate everybody who is piling into the comment section into the chat. Uh, whatever platform you are consuming this podcast or video cast on, please like, please subscribe. We are also Super Chat Live, uh, which is exciting when you've got a legend in the house. And I'm not speaking of you tonight. We have that's another. Okay. Former Bills legend, uh, Steve Tasker will be joining us just in a moment, but it's so good to have every single one of you. Uh, why don't we start this thing off? Why don't we hear from our title sponsor, uh, uh, John Spazcheck, right now? What do you say? I love it. I love to hear from John Spazcheck. His message is fantastic. Here it comes. Strategy, strategy, block, block, vision. Get your vision up, balance, foot back, head up. Yeah, these are some of the strategies my good friend John Fina used to dominate on the field when he was playing for our great Buffalo football team. And these are some of the things that I use in real estate to dominate as the market dominator and also the proud sponsor of the John Fina Show hosted by Joe Miller. So if you want to win in the real estate market, It's gonna be important to bring good vision so you can see what's out there, good balance of the market. Folks, strategy is critical, and this is what we do. We educate, we advocate, we negotiate, and And, we dominate. dominate. So if you wanna win the way our football team is, you call me directly, 716-570-3298. Let's go, Buffalo! Let's go, Buffalo. That is the market dominator, John Spazcheck himself. If you're looking to buy or sell a home, please give him and his team a call, 716-570-3298. That number again, 716-570-3298. John, we appreciate you. We appreciate all of our sponsors here on the Off Tackle with John Fina show, but uh, we probably shouldn't even like really like delay and stuff. We should just get into this thing, you think? Oh, 100%, man. One of my, 100%. One of my favorite teammates. Yeah, are you? Was there more to that conversation or no? No, man. I mean, I don't, want to, embar- I don't want. I don't want to embarrass the guy, <laughs> but he uh, he really looked out for me my rookie year, and awesome. he showed me the ropes. He was a steady Eddie kind of guy, you know, on the field, a different guy, but in the locker room, man. I he, mean, this is the guy you went to. He was a menace on the field, but uh, drafted in the ninth round of the nineteen eighty five NFL draft at a Northwestern by the Houston Oilers. Two years later, he was picked up by the Buffalo Bills off of waivers, where he would go on to become one of the most prolific special teams players and an excellent wide receiver when called upon in NFL history. Played with the Bills for 12 years, 204 special teams tackles, seven block punts, seven Pro Bowl selections. The only special teams player ever elected to be the Pro Bowl MVP. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the show, Steve Tasker. Steve, welcome, my friend. Good to hey, have guys. You. How are you? It's good to be here. We happy are Victory here. Monday to you, Steve. Yeah, happy Victory Monday. It's not, That's you know, I, I don't usually drink while I'm on the air or broadcasting, but... 
<laughs> yeah, I got I have constraints, but this is my this is my office at that. You got to get your contract. So right. uh, you get your contract rewritten. <laughs> That's funny. So, yeah. Steve, what have you been up yeah. to lately? Are you doing anything with the Bills anymore? What do you like? What do you do day to day now? Yeah, I'm on every day. I'm on live every day for two hours, five two hours of radio show. One Bills live. Yeah, uh, we do that. Chris Brown and I are on that two hours a day. Today we're on three hours on Victory Mondays. On Mondays after games, we're on three hours. Uh, I do pregame, post game with Maddie Glab for the team. I'm still on the payroll over there. That's uh, awesome. I today I taped the Sean uh, the Sean McDermott show with Coach. Uh, on Mondays, we do that after the game. So yeah, I do that, and uh, yeah, I'm a full time guy over with the over at the stadium. I'm in the field house all day, every day, and That's awesome. uh, it's not. I'll tell you, it is kind of awesome because it's a great place to be these days. Mm. Great people, great leadership. Uh, the ownership has been fantastic. The coach, the general manager, all the people down through the the ranks of the organization. It's really a quality place to work. It really is. That's awesome. That's awesome. There might have been a few years ago where it was kind of uh, rough going into the field house. I mean, you're taking yeah, the slings I, and arrows from every direction. Right. Well, it's, you know, uh, it was a tough spot for the organization to be in. I mean, you're talking about, you know, pre probably 2013 when Ralph was still on the team. Um, Ralph was a great owner, loved him, and I owed him a lot. But for the when I retired, the guy was 80. And, you know, it's hard to get quality, you know, coaches and guys to sign on long term to an organization they don't think is going to be owned by that guy in six months. And they went that he lived to be 95. So it was a 15 year period where after I left, where it was very difficult for them to get quality coaches and stuff like that for the Bills, not because Ralph was, you know, back, but, you know, Ownership's an issue when you're talking about coaches. So uh, yeah, um, uncertainty, man. You take yeah. everything into account, right? Uh, these so, guys you know, have fa- these guys have families too. They got to weigh every variable when entertaining right. a job. And so um, it was tough for a long time. Not and, and that's not the only reason. I mean, there were other reasons as well. You know, draft picks and where they stood in the draft and salary cap and things. You know, philosophies and stuff like that. But once Terry Pagula and Kim bought it and took it over. Uh, you know, they Doug Marone left the organization under their watch. He just said, I'm done and left. That's, you know, another illustration of uncertain owners. Um, he left. They hired Rex because Rex, I think they were new to the game. Rex came in and swept them off their feet. Rex is a, a verbose guy, really, you know, he's a gregarious guy. You know, it's fun to hang out with him. I'm sure he swept them off their feet in the interview process. But I'll say this the minute it became real, that Rex wasn't the guy, they did not care. He was done. Wow. <laughs> I mean, they, they, that's done. the business, though, right? I mean, it, you and call it I, you know, it wasn't but... that way. Hey, it wasn't that way with Ralph, you know, because they're still on the hook for his salary and all that. And Terry, to his credit, he said, hey, I do not care. We're not – I am not living like this. Get me – and then they went. They got consultants. They had people who talked about it, and, and the experts come in. What are you looking for in a head coach? Here's what you should look for. The experts uh, in the real world came in and got them on the right track. And, of course, they hired Brandon Bean and Sean McDermott. And now they're in the playoffs every stinking year. And they're one of the best clubs in the league. So, yeah, yeah, they learned. One of the best clubs in the league, like the secret that we had when we were there. You know, it was like the best. Yeah, well, it's not just the club. Yeah, it's not just the club. You're right. And now it is the club. But it's also, you know, the city and how the, you know, the, the city of Buffalo and the fan base have rallied and proven themselves to be something different than other yeah. fan bases. Yeah. Something well, special. Steve, and that's, that's pretty cool. It is really cool. And and with that, Steve, I know you're a conduit to places uh, unreachable by Joe and I. So please, please extend uh, all, everybody in the chat, all of, uh, all of our listeners and yours, of course, our best wishes for... Uh, both Kim Pagula and John Murphy, whom uh, you must know very, very well. And, you know, just send it up the chain, whether you just get your vibes a little bit closer than we can. Uh, I know Joe and I and everybody in the chat here would really appreciate it. So yeah, for sure. Yeah. And and actually, even to that Absolutely. point, and yeah. going doubling back to even DeMar Hamlin um, and just seeing what that whole situation brought about. And as a man of faith and John is a man of faith and Steve, I know you're a man of faith. 
just seeing the spiritual awakening that kind of happened through that whole situation across this nation due to, you know, a Buffalo Bills player. Um, can you real quick, briefly kind of take us through, because I know that talking with John, I know talking with Jerry Ostrowski, that they were shook as even former players by just what they kind of saw and how things happened. Where where were you at just headspace-wise, mind-wise, heart-wise, spiritually? Like, where were you at through that whole process? Um, I, I was, uh, I was at the stadium. We were watching because we do live post game, pre game from the stadium. So I have to watch the, the away games there with, with the crew in a control room. And we have a bunch of people there. And when it happened, uh, you know, you know how it is. You, you think, okay, yeah, how long is he going to be down? They'll pick him up and they'll, they'll take him off and we'll get going again. And then when the player, when we come back from a commercial, they went to, I don't know if you guys realize, they went to like four commercial breaks yes. right away. And during, and I didn't know this until later, but a lot of things happened while the national TV audience was away in breaks. There were, there was sprinting and guys bringing the defib guy out to the middle of the field. The, they brought the players, they asked the players to surround them right. so that it wouldn't be seen. And that's very unusual. They brought the ambulance up there. All this stuff's going on that is, all of a sudden, it became not just another injury. Every player from both sidelines was on the field. Mm -hmm. They were hurt, huddled around, and you could see camera shots of the shock and horror and the surprise, the just the unbelievable reaction of some of the players, you know, DeMar's teammates, Josh, uh, Tredavious White, Steph Biggs, all these guys. It was unbelievable. And I could feel for Joe Buck and Troy Aikman in the booth trying to grab they don't have anything to say there's mm -hmm. nothing they can say right, they're looking right. for anything to say so their guy john terry or uh i think it's i think it's john terry john perry i'm sorry john perry right. i think he's in the booth with joe and troy and i'm sure he was on the phone with new york saying hey what's the story what are we going to do and new york some guy the guy he calls in new york which is a commonplace occurrence probably said hey usually it's a five minute warm-up after this is all done and we we kind of get it going that's what usually happens so Perry hangs the phone up, looks at Troy Aikman and Joe and says, well, I talked to New York and they said like a five minute warm up and they'll get back at it. And so Joe, Troy and Joe say, well, we've been told by New York, which <laughs> technically is true, but it's just the, it's a procedural thing. It's not what right. they're going to do. Right. Yeah. Um, they come out. Hey, it's going to be five minutes. and They're going to go start going. And Joe Burrell's out there warming up. He doesn't know how it's going to go. And. When and I didn't know that I kind of put these pieces together later. When Joe, when Zach Taylor walked across the field and talked to Sean McDermott, you can see Sean talking with him with his hand over his mouth. Mm -hmm. And Sean, and we heard later that Sean said, "Listen, I don't need to be coaching this team. I need to be at the hospital with Demar." And both coaches were unwilling to proceed. Yeah, yep. That right then and there is when the decision was made. Those ten yep. coaches said, "We ain't doing it." That was a powerful and moment. To their, yes, was, and to, to their credit. The, to their credit, Troy Vincent and and uh, Roger Goodell took their word for it and believed the guys that were there, the head coach. Yeah, said you're right. We're doing it. Yeah, you, kudos you, to the league for backing those guys up in that moment. You never see a head coach make his way all the way across the field to the other sideline. When he made that beeline for Sean McDermott, I looked at my wife and my daughter I was like, "This game's over." And they're like, "How do you know?" I was like, "Because this that you're watching right now never happens. Never." It's yeah, unprecedented. I, I'll tell you what was a beautiful moment about that. And you know what? Sure, there might have been some gaffes, five minute warm up, the game goes on. You know, I can forgive all of that because this was this is unprecedented. Mm -hmm. But what I love is that the two guys who were in charge of running the show were just able to say, you know, we've always said that life is bigger than football, mm -hmm. that there are some things that are bigger than football. And when there was the opportunity to go either way, they really chose to stand by the words of themselves and the players and humanity, I guess, yeah. you know, and that, that was, yeah. that was, I guess, I thought it was looking back on it. It's heartwarming. Yeah. It was an enormously positive moment for the league in a tragic, what could have been a tragic city, uh, a tragic setting. Mm -hmm. uh, and after that, you know, when the, when the game was over, we didn't, you know, nobody knew how tomorrow was going to be. And we ne never knew, didn't know how positive it was going to turn out. Um, it was for about, I don't know what was it, 72 hours. They finally got some. He was off the ventilator and they said he's going to do it. And he, and he, he FaceTimed the team and flexed mm -hmm. for him. 
the time between that FaceTime and the incident on Monday Night Football was a very, very difficult week for all of us here mm-hmm. in Buffalo. Mm-hmm. At the, it, working over there, very difficult week. Uh, the club had asked us, me and Chris Brown, my co-host on One Bills Live, and Maddie Glab, who's the team reporter, we're the three kind of media personalities. Of course, the players are the center of it all. We're just kind of facilitators. But they told us, and my and you can imagine, my phone was absolutely exploding with requests all over the country to come on and talk about it. What's going on with the team? How are the players acting? How are they feeling? What's going on with the coaches? The whole thing. And the club rightfully said, don't do it until – don't do it for at least for this week, maybe ne- not next week either. Mm-hmm. And so that was a big relief because it was – I don't know how any other way to say it. It was very, very difficult for all of us to go to work and continue on and the players, especially. So yeah, it was a big moment when, when DeMar came out of the woods. Yeah. And uh, God just being in it. And like I said, seeing the spiritual awakening and just even like the references to the number three, which he wears and you know, the numbers have great significance uh, in scripture. The number three is the number of perfection. And just to see that number pop up so many times, even kind of as he was coming out of this thing, uh, has been tremendous. And I actually noticed, so there's three of us, this is unscripted, and we're all wearing the standing Buffalo logo. So let's just take that <laughs> as a sign that God's in this this weekend. So because yeah. I'll we, say this, <laughs> if you can if you can watch the opening kickoff of that New England Patriot game and not think it's something supernatural happened, I don't know, you don't have a pulse. But, yeah. um, I've never, I told my, even from when my kids were being born, all the sporting events my kids have been to, all the great things I've seen as an analyst, the things I took part in, I have never been a part of something that moved me and and where I was absolutely sure that there was a greater power involved than that play right there. Yeah. I could not believe what I was seeing. And it was it was an absolute miracle fairy tale. Yeah. And Josh said the same thing. I mean, you can't, you know, you could feel it. I mean, there's just there's people that you just can't come up with another explanation for it. It was miraculous. And uh, to have, you know, Naheem Hines take the opening kickoff of that game, 96 yards for a touchdown. Mm. I was Incredible. absolutely, I was standing up in the radio. I, we watched the game in the radio booth behind John Murphy and Eric Wood. In this case, it was Chris Brown and Eric Wood. We were standing up behind, and I was standing up with both hands on top of my head, screaming. I could not believe it. I lost my mind. I absolutely lost my mind. I've never lost my mind at any moment in my career or since over a play like I've lost my mind over that Naheem Hines kickoff return. Never. It's unbelievable. It's amazing. Well, uh, Steve, thank you so much for just just bringing that back to us and telling us that story because every 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 story is unique. All of us, it, it affected all of us so so much and was so difficult, as you said. Buffalo Rumbling shut down, so like we do a ton of podcasts and a ton of video stuff, and we like I have an, a post game show, the overreaction post game show that I do every week after the game, and like. I canceled that. Like, so we did the same exact thing that the bills had you do. We just shut it down and we let just kind of the moment be the moment and let's get through this together as a country. So yeah. thank you again for just, just kind of reliving that and letting us know, let's move to the football game and let's talk about uh, this past football game. And then we'll talk about uh, briefly what's going to happen, hopefully in the Bengals game. But before we do, uh, John's going to let us know about house capital real quick. Yeah, Steve, I just want to, just want to let you know, man, the next time, you're going to buy a house. Look, everybody's got a guy, right? But if you need work on your roof, Joe Miller can do it. Heck, I can do your inspection because everybody knows somebody. But when you're looking to get your financing together, Steve Tasker, you need to call Brian Belser from House Capital Corporation because he will be your guy. Brian Belser and House Capital make the mortgage process simple, hassle-free, and understandable. At House Capital, their preferred relationships with some of the top lenders give you the edge up and getting the financing you need. Steve Tasker, take it to the house with House Capital. Take it to the house. Brian Belser. Give, Brian Jill, Belser. give Brian Belser a call if you have the opportunity. So let's uh, let's start with the, uh, the just your overarching high just high level thoughts as we do every single week of this game. Steve, we're going to give you the floor. So just first glance, thoughts on this football game against the Miami Dolphins on Sunday. 
Well, Bills are a really good football team, and they have seen the enemy, and it is them. <laughs> you know, they are their own worst enemy. Uh, I have said it. They, I did a thing today on the radio. The Bills over their last twenty nine games are twenty five and four. Uh, no, that's sorry, twenty four and five. Sorry, they're twenty four wins, five losses. Of the five losses, two of them are overtime losses by touchdowns, one to Tampa Bay, one to Kansas City. The other three losses are by a total of eight points. Mm-hmm. They are a tough team to beat, a tough team to beat. Uh, even when they turn it over three times. Uh, Seven sacks. And they never they, – ne- they don't seem to be clicking on all cylinders. Josh is throwing it to the wrong jersey. You look up and it's 30 – they've scored 34 points. I mean, they are good. They're really, really good. And um, it's going to take a, a great effort by the Cincinnati Bengals to beat them. Now, the Bengals are good, too. They've got some guys, and they've got a good defense. They're stacked. No mm-hmm. question about it. And they look good early in that Monday night game before it was stopped because of DeMar's incident. They, but for me, um, most teams, it has been – uh, typical for me that most teams really make some hay offensively early in games against the Bills. Mm-hmm. Yep. One of the things that the Buffalo Bills have done really well with Leslie Frazier as their coordinator and Sean McDermott and the whole crew, they put the screws down and they in-game adjust yep. really well, really well. It gets harder and harder and more difficult and more difficult to score on this team as the game goes on. But early on, teams will make hay. They will make hay. They'll score some points the first quarter. Teams will, you know, they'll get off to a fi- fast start before the Bills start to to rally. Yeah. yeah. And uh, offensively, you know, I think teams are really doing their best. Last week, uh, week 18 of the regular season against New England, they did it. And now I think that the Miami Dolphins did it in this last game. When they're defending Josh Allen, teams are doing their best to rush him, but make sure he doesn't pull the ball down with it. Yeah. If Bills, if he's going to beat you, make him do it from the pocket. Right. Well, he scored 35 on New England and 34 on on the Dolphins, and he beat them both. But let's say it wasn't – it didn't look like the Bills' offense because they made him stand in the pocket and beat him. When he tried to leave, they tackled him. And that's right. hard to do sometimes. And sometimes he made some plays, particularly against the New England Patriots. He got out of the pocket a couple of times, made big plays outside the pocket, the John Brown play, uh, all of that. So, yeah, he does beat him, but he didn't. He really never ran the football. This last week he was four rushes for 20 yards mm-hmm. against the Dolphins. Week 18 he had nine rushes for 17 yards against New England. That's not – Josh usually runs for 75 yards, right? I mean, he's usually 50 mm-hmm. plus yards for rushing. Those two, those, that's a strategy I think teams are starting to unfurl against the Bills offense. So defensively, the Bills kind of clamp down. It takes them a little while to get started sometimes, but they do play well against everybody. And then for the offense, it's what I said. Uh, <laughs> Josh is really good, man. Really good. He's really good. <laughs> and uh, they're hard to beat. They're really hard to beat. Steve, you're you're uh you're a legend just like I am, more so for sure. You know, there's a lot of hype about the line in Vegas and things of that nature, but expectations of the game, uh, you know, to me, I look at this, I say, oh, you know, the weather might be three points. You know, they got the third string quarterback, but you know what, he's a man too. You know, I thought in my heart the whole time, you know, eight points would have been tops for me on the spread because Divisional game too, right? Third time you're playing these guys and beyond Skylar Thompson, these guys know each other pretty damn well. So, uh, you know, what was your feeling like? Yeah. And I know you're a pragmatist a little bit like I am, but you weren't, you weren't seeing a blowout. And do you, do you hear a lot of that? And you just shake your head like I do? <laughs> A little bit. Yeah. And I, I always remind myself when they do the betting lines in Vegas or any place else, they, they're not, they're not saying who they think really will win the game. Mm-hmm. What, what their signs on is what they will bet. Not what they, not how the game may or may not come out. Cause if you're talking about how the game's going to come out, none of us know, right? None of us know. Um, but they're thinking, all right, I think the public perception is that the Bills are pretty stinking good. 
and the Dolphins are starting their backup, their third string quarterback. Nobody thinks this is going to should be a close game. This is, and that's what I think. That's how they set the line. So for mm-hmm. me, I, the line as much reality as it is public perception. And and as you know, practice is closed. <laughs> they just that's don't right. know. They, they just, just don't, don't know. know for sure. For yeah. sure. Well, I, you know, I, I would like to dovetail on what you said. I'm, I'm in most, mostly agreement with you. To me, um, you know, Josh has enjoyed some pretty free releases on his runs. I think he's a terrific pocket passer. Uh, still could get better, but you know, I look at some of the the pre-snap reads that he's making, and you know, the understanding, and it matters too if it's a, a three or four man rush. If on the snap you can see if there's a spy or not, you know, then maybe you're not tucking the ball and running. Maybe you're maybe you're throwing that up for grabs ball 20 yards downfield or you know, just throwing it away. Yeah. So, you know, I, I mean he's a great quarterback. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think that I think there's still more development. Do you where do you see like Josh's next step? I think for this offseason, I think one of the things that he does needs work on, and you'll see it particularly early in games when he does the quick release or if he if he wants to get rid of the ball really fast on a slant or something where he's got a quick check and then come off and go to a different guy real fast on a short route. It's not real accurate when he's throwing those kind of darts. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's pretty mm-hmm. good on a slant where he knows where he's going, comes out and knows one guy, but when he comes off that guy and goes to another guy, Unless he sets his feet really quick and lets it go right, he has trouble putting it on the guy. Mm. You've seen some slants, and and we've got a lot of problems with drops, you know, this year in the receiving yep. core. Some of that's on Josh because he doesn't quite put it in the right spot because he hurries his throw a lot. He's he's got he's got a little arm arrogance, and he knows he can make every throw, and little. it's easy for him. It's easy for him, so he never takes the time to set his feet. And it's not, a, and for Josh, it's not about getting the throw made. It's about mechanics of getting it there and putting it right where you need to put it. He can, yeah. he can throw it everywhere. Yeah, and you're I right about that. that. I mean, he on. he doesn't have to set his feet, and he yeah. showed that numerous right. times in the game yesterday. Have, you know, he's all over the all yeah. over the place, and the ball comes right. out on a dart. But if he does, I think to to your point, if he can get settled a little bit before he makes that throw, the difference of eight to ten inches where it meets the receiver is a difference between a reception right. and a drop. Right. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, we had a, especially we had a, in the new England game last week. Go ahead. Oh, I was say we had a, we had a, we had a fun conversation with Drew Bledsoe about five weeks ago, you know, probably the only other guy that can talk about arm arrogance to the extent or the level that, that Josh can. And we, we had a fun little breakdown with just Drew, just talking about just arm strength and the ability to put the ball anywhere you yeah. want to on the football field. So, yeah. And you look at the you look at the New England game two weeks ago, and you know he had like three drops early in that game. One was to Gabe Davis. It was on a slant. It was back on his back off his back leg. You know, behind him, he's down low. He couldn't even grab it. You know, but he, right. he hits it and it, it drops to the ground. Other throws like that are the ones I like to see him clean up. Now, in yeah. early in the season, they were running their offense and they were really efficient. They were staying on the field longer than they did a year ago, but they weren't hitting the big plays like they did a year ago. Now, yeah. last couple of weeks, it's back to big play, big play, big play. But I think that was a little dictated by the defense, particularly in this last game. So I'd love to break that down just real quick, and then we can talk about it probably at some other point as well. For me, so sitting in the stands, I was a wreck. So my show, Steve, just so you know, because I'm sure you're not familiar, is called the Overreaction Post Game Show, and it's about it's based on the fact that Bills Mafia. What do we do? All football fans overreact. So my show is not about X's and O's. It's not about the science of the game. My show is I'm bringing to you the fan how I felt on the couch, and more than likely, <laughs> you felt the same. And there was times in that stadium that I was like nauseous. But the the moment after the strip sack for a fumble, the 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 crowd was deathly silent, not because we were respecting the offense being on the field. We were shell-shocked. We couldn't believe the last, what, four minutes of football that we had watched from the second or the first half of the second half. Um, but on the rewatch, so watching it again today, that was a really good football game. Like, when you break it down, like when you know what the outcome is going to be and you're not stressed out, it was just a good 
football game. But to your point about the offense as well, you know, there's a, a, a handle on Twitter at yards per pass, and he used to do a lot of just breakdown stuff. And this is the best thing I've heard about this Bills offense in 2022. And I talked about it last night on the show. He said this after the game. He said, I have zero idea how the Bills put up so many points on offense. He said, it just seems like a cluster most of the time. Like, just it's just chaos. He said, and then you look up at the scoreboard, and they've scored 30-plus points more often than not. And that just... Uh, it, that's like, exactly what Steve said, right? You know, you got, you're got you shooting yourself in the foot, and at the same time, you're hitting the end zone to the tune of 31 points. Right, yeah. It's like 34. I mean, it's, it was crazy. Have either right. of you seen a team make as many self-inflicted self-inflect, mistakes? So not like... Uh, not a, not a, a a bad coverage on a you know on a defensive play that let up a touchdown, just self inflicted inflicted mistakes as this team seems to make week in and week out and overcome them. It just seems unreal. I've never seen a team find a way to win more than this team finds. They just find. You said it, Steve, at the top. This is a good football team. Like yeah they're, yeah I, yeah. They're I, go ahead. I, I think uh, you know what you're saying, Joe, and what everybody out there is saying is like. We want and we're aching for seeing the Bills put together the beautiful game. Well, the 90s Bills, and it, I'm old. Right, I mean, right, right. there was no, so get it. much perfection in execution for four years that we were just like, watch this. Like, yeah, <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, it's it's crazy, right? I mean, I was uh, I was up, I was in Phoenix, uh, Steve, uh, with Glenn Parker, Jeff Wright. Oh okay. man! All right. Yeah, and Mark Maddox, oh, walking nice. at watching at a, a Bills backers bar, the bonfire in Tempe or Chandler, and it was a bonfire. Oh, yeah. I saw your I, I saw your tweet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. I'm sitting there with Jay Spence. Who also does uh, a couple of shows on our on our network here? He's in the comments section right now. Yeah, yeah, he's with us tonight, and he and I were like, I, you know, you know, when you're like mixing it up with your buddy, and he's got me in a headlock, and we're jamming <laughs> each other up, and then all of a sudden, one play later, our hands are at our arms, going on our sides, go, what the hell just happened, you know? And yeah. I think we're just craving for, I don't know if the word is a boring, methodical. Um, you know, playbook football. We, I, I think, frankly, a lot of people would just like to see that so their nerves aren't so frayed. Yeah. Well, the worst thing that happened yeah. was that it, Buffalo Bills it, Patriots playoff game in Buffalo last year, the perfect game. I mean, that's yeah, the worst right. thing that could have happened that's to Buffalo Bills gonna, fans. That's the one I was going to mention. You think that's the way every team, every game's got to go, right? Um, right. And certainly, I'll say this, when the Bills play the way they did that night and when Josh plays the way he did that night, yeah, they can do that to a lot of a lot of teams, a lot of yeah. teams. Um, yeah. But it it's hard to do. I mean, you know how we've never seen it before. It's it's rare that a team can yeah. put that kind of effort together. Um, yeah. I I think this you know this game that we just watched uh, and how frustrating it was. You know, with you and the overreaction post. I mean, I get it. I was feeling the same thing. But I'll just say this. Um, this team, when you get down to it, this team plays its best in big moments. Mm. Uh, all mm. of them, particularly yep. Josh, and particularly Steph Diggs, and particularly some of the other some of the other guys you can name as well. Milano, um, yep. they yep. show up big. Yep, and I think that's going to continue to be the case. That doesn't mean they're going to win every game, but I'll say this: I I don't know how. If I've seen them play so poorly that a team's going to run off and leave them on the scoreboard, the only time we've seen it is in the Indianapolis game, Cold game last, year. last year when they came back and avenged a playoff loss, which I can understand mm-hmm. that. Uh, mm-hmm. But our run defense wasn't what it is last, you know, last year, and they they we were susceptible to it, and they took advantage of it. Good on them. Uh, you know, they still didn't get to the playoffs. Yeah. Yeah, that was it. And and I've, and I've been on teams like that where to avenge something when you bring those guys together and you get an, an opponent that you can really rally up to and get after. Yeah, a bad team can play great. Um, that's what happened. I'm not saying that they were a bad team, but they played great against us that day. Other than that, this team is hard to beat mm-hmm. by by double digits, by 10, by seven, by eight. It's mm-hmm. hard to beat this team like that. They've had, 
In their last 29 games, they've had two games they lost by six points in overtime. They were overtime games. Right. Other than that, you can't you don't beat them. Right. It's, it's, cra- it's crazy to think about. There it's really crazy is. to think about this uh, run that it, they've been I, on. You, you said you, it, and you know, you know, most people you get so caught up in the last game and the things that you loved and the mm-hmm. things that you hated, and you you know, you you can't like just gravitate back to quantifying something like that. And then when you said it, I thought to myself, Holy cow, we have a great football team. And uh, Steve, we had uh, Josh Allen's father on, mm-hmm. and I, I keep talking about how we this team finds a way. It's not always beautiful. It, it looks like a disaster every now and again, but they find a way. And Josh Allen, his father, Joel, would say to him, what, the whole time he was growing up, everything about competition was APO, adjust, persevere, and overcome. overcome. And I, I, you know, I, I took that down in my notes, Joe, and I was like, I think I still have that because all this stuff that Steve's talking about brings me back to what Joel Allen said. Yep. Adjust. Yeah persevere and Josh overcome. is a great example of it I mean he's he is really he's so gifted obviously and he and he does have some things that get him into trouble because he's you know the biggest baddest guy on the field um, <laughs> I love he's that LeBron. And, he, he is and, LeBron yeah hey. and so you know that gets him into trouble sometimes but when he gets in the right zone in any given Sunday you know there's never there's never been anybody like him yeah there's never been anybody like him. John Elway was a good, maybe good imitation of him because John could run and stuff. But back then, you know, you didn't do it because yeah. there was no quarterback protection. You were, you know, you were going to get a label out of bounds. Forget yeah. about, forget about, a, a you know, a cheap hit on the sidelines. You were going to get ridden out of bounds and driven into the ground. Right. So, you know, they didn't want their quarterbacks doing that. And it was a smart move back then. Now you need those guys to do that. And Josh is, there's nobody like Josh who can do that. So, yeah, as well as he can. And yeah. so, hey, uh, you know, it's just it's a different world. And Josh is the perfect guy for it. Hey, Steve, we're at this point in the show where what popped out at you? Like what what are some shining moments, performances or by groups that you saw that we could take away from this game? So not everybody in the comment section and listening through this on the download, you know, continues to have their little mini uh, meltdowns. Right. Tell us something good. Yeah. I'll say that, you know, I always think about what, what I learned about what I always love getting to look at if there's any different kind of game plan that people use against Josh and this team. Mm-hmm. What are they, you know, you know, what are they doing? And mm-hmm. we talked mm-hmm. about it earlier. They're the Dolphins, they brought pressure and they went zero and single high safety manned up on the outside and they brought pressure and they didn't want pressure to make Josh or allow Josh to get out of pocket. There's two things. There's two parts of it. Not only are they going to bring an extra rusher, but they were going to hem him in. They weren't running very many stunts. They weren't crossing and Xing too much. They were just coming up their lanes, making sure Josh had to stay back there and just throw. He, if, if he could beat him from the pocket, so be it. That was the chance they were going to take. And they were manning up on the outside. That's why they were going deep after deep ball after deep ball after deep ball. There's no safety back there. All you got to do is heave it up and I mean pass interference, illegal contact, whatever, or it's you're going to complete it. Now, the one miscommunication with John Brown, you know, Josh throws it up, and to me, um a little bit of bad luck, a little mixed with a little bit of, you know taking a big gamble that didn't pay off on the John Brown interception. If a quarterback throws it up to you like that, as you're a receiver, you got to see it. You got to know he's saying, Hey, make a play, you know, just make a play, go up and get it. Help me out. See if you can get it. But if you can't, don't let that guy get it. And John Brown, he would know that, but he didn't see, he didn't, couldn't find the ball. He found it too late. Couldn't adjust. Couldn't and really all he wanted to do was tackle a guy before the ball even got there. If he wasn't going to catch it, just pull the guy down and let the ball bounce. But he didn't pick the ball up in time. That means the guy catches it and gets a chance to run it back. And you know, and they're often running with a big return on a on a on a play. Um, but that's what the team was going to do, and that's what I come out of this with. Last two weeks, clubs have made a concerted effort not to let Josh Allen run with the football. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And you know they hung thirty-five points on the Patriots, and they hung thirty-four points on the Dolphins. So they were they were, but they were they got to feel like 
they did that. He only rushed for 17 or 16 yards against the Patriots, and he rushed for 20 against the Dolphins on four rush. Yeah. That's a different kind of stat line. And if you can start affecting that, maybe you can you can find a way to beat him. And of course, when when you're going zero coverage, zero safety with and bringing if you're blocking five and they're bringing six, and you're blocking six and they're bringing seven. Either they're going to nick you for a big play like the Bills were trying to do, or sooner or later somebody's come free and he has to pop, pat the ball and he gets whacked. And it's a sack strip fumble and touchdown going the other way. Or you lay one out on the deep ball and, he, and it's a misadjustment and you get an interception. So yeah. in some of those cases, you're going to get a play back. And the Dolphins, to their credit, they were willing to take the lumps early. Yeah. The Steph Dig 52 yarder. You know, the long plays they were getting early. They were listen, we gotta this is, if we're gonna win, this is how we're gonna do it. We can't deviate from it. And they didn't, even when they were down 17 nothing. And sure enough, they started getting turnovers and it turned around for them. Yeah, couple- it did. It did. And you know, when I look at the good on this, Steve, I mean, yeah, you know, w- <laughs> the offense put the defense in some pretty, pretty rough situations. And you know, everybody, well, if we didn't have those turnovers, blah, blah, blah. But honestly, I think the defense crushed it. The short fields yes. they had to defend mm-hmm. and everything that agree. they did. And beyond that, the secondary looked tighter than I've seen them in weeks. I, I think, you know, Elam's getting his confidence. Tredavious White, uh, you know, he, he got he had a step on the guy had a step on him. I, I can't remember who it was, but his recovery speed is coming back. He lays out, he takes a swipe at the ball, you know, obfuscates it. The receiver can't make the catch. Um Milano had, you know, one or two kind of missed tackles, but Tremaine Edwins looked great. I thought we had we had fair to good pressure from the front four and the and the run stopping was terrific. I mean, to me, the hallmark yeah. of this game is defense can win championships and if you can really tighten the defense up at, at this run part of the season, you know, it gives those guys on the offense maybe as we saw a little bit of latitude. They may they take a few long shots and they can still recover because Leslie Frazier and Milano and Edmonds are there to back them up. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I thought, I think you're right. I, one of the things I noticed too, because we've struggled at it in weeks past at certain times, I thought the defense as a whole, you mentioned Milano missing a couple of tackles. I thought on the whole, the defense tackled really well yesterday. Really well. I, there's yeah. been games where, there have been games when they didn't. And, and it's, it sounds simple and it is, but it's not easy. And when you say it, People say, of course, but if you watch for it, it's it's evident. The best tackling team is the best defense. Mm-hmm. The first guy to the football makes the tackle. No extra yards, no broken tackles, no you know the guy get they got to have guys open to get yards, and they're not open. And the first guy there makes the tackle. That happened yesterday. A lot of tackles that were one guy, first guy there, boom down. Uh, they did a really much better job yesterday than I've seen them do in a while at tackling, and. You know, Milano getting two sacks um, and then, you know, uh, Boogie Basham getting a sack, Ed mm-hmm. Oliver getting a sack. Um, the defensive Steve, line I got to ask you a question. Is it really a sack if you just beat a tight end to the quarterback? I mean, come on. Shouldn't it? Shouldn't Listen, Boogie just get a half a sack for beating a tight end? I mean, I is that you, really but... a football player? Listen. If a quarterback scrambles around and runs out of bounds a yard deep, it's a sack. It's a sack. I know. <laughs> Roll the ball that's, away. Throw look, away. That's, and that's I'm the a BS huge, sack. I'm a me. huge fan of, of Basham. When I, you know, I watched him in college, uh, a couple of games, and, I'm, and I, I didn't know who he was. I kept going, "Who is that guy? He's amazing." Right, yeah, and then man. when the draft came, and they're like, "Yo, Boogie Basham from uh, the Demon Deacons," I was like. Hey, that's the guy. <laughs> so that's the guy. I'm a, I'm a, I'm yeah, he's fan. he played. I'll say what he played great yesterday. And you know, this game coming up against you know Cincinnati, they may have. I doubt that they will, but they may have three offensive linemen from their starting five out. Yeah, uh, and it all depends on Jonah Williams if he can come back. He dislocated his kneecap. He did the same injury in week five, but he mm-hmm. came back and played the next week. Um. Mm-hmm. Uh, Lyle Collins is not going to be in there, and it Kappa, their guard, he may be back with a with an ankle. I'm thinking at least one or one of those guys, one of Jonah Williams or Kappa, 
will come back. Uh, maybe both, but they you know still going to be without Lyle Collins. So well, I thought well, the game completely changed. You know this, John. Last night's game against the Baltimore Ravens, everything changed oh. when Jonah Williams went out and they lost mm-hmm. to an offensive lineman. Yeah. Uh, all of a sudden, the Bengals stopped scoring points and stopped moving the football, and it was yep. all because of a be- the guys up front being different. Well, we're, you, we're gonna you, we're gonna you, we're gonna talk about that, but uh, you can look we're, at, gonna you, also, we're gonna also talk about uh, James Cook. Yeah, you can look at the Patriots game, the first Patriots game a couple weeks ago when uh, Spencer Brown was out and Quisenberry was out there injured, and Uche. Like it's yeah. like, who is this kid? This kid looks like a monster. Like, are we gonna have to deal? Like, is he another Jalen Phillips? Like, all of a sudden, the, the 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 Patriots have found the next guy, and then Spencer Brown goes out there healthy, and you don't even hear Uche's name in the second game. So yeah, to your point, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, thought, Joe, that I was that was a, a uh, that was a hint, Joe. If you didn't get it, I got it. Of course, I got okay. it. All right, so, I always get Steve, it. Steve, this is the part where we have to give the nod to Q42, our barbecue sponsor. Q42 Imana ZC makes fantastic rubs and sauces. And we're in the damn playoffs, which means you got to take your tailgate to the playoff caliber level, Steve. <laughs> if you're not eating totally Q42 barbecue sauces and rubs, all natural, no filler, crafted in small batches right here in Western New York. And most importantly, John Fina approved. Then you need to go to Q42barbecue.com. That's Q U E. 42bbq.com. And as long as the Bills are still playing, Steve Tasker, you will save 33%. What? 33? Yeah. Threes and threes, baby. We're going wow. with the threes. There you go. <laughs> when you ground and pound in that coupon code, all capital letters, FINA show, <laughs> even Steve Tasker, the legend, can smoke and grill and barbecue like me. For Victory beer. Monday, Q42Barbecue.com. Steve, are you a barbecue guy? Am I a barbecue guy? I'm a, yeah. I am eat it. I don't do it. You don't do it? Uh, well, Q42 no. is, uh, dare I say, taking over Western New York. Um, it's really like my wife is a not, – she's not an aspiring chef. She's just a gifted cooking person like John is. John is very much similar. And uh, the Carolina gold that he has, she just abs- – it's funny because I said that last week. Legit, I said last week that my wife loves the Carolina gold. It's her favorite uh, barbecue sauce. Three days later, two bottles of Carolina gold show up in the mail. <laughs> so, Iman, I hear you. Nice. I appreciate you, and I love you. So you are yeah. you are the man. It, it, Steve, <laughs> it is really good stuff, and I am an enthusiast in the kitchen, and if it sucked, I wouldn't use it. So, And just so you um, know, the Q42, the 42 – so Buffalo is on the 42nd parallel. So that's where the Q42 comes from. So so that 42 is where Buffalo was at. Oh, I got it. Yeah, I'm I'm in a village here outside of Buffalo, and and – the village at the other end of town is called 42 North. So it's just oh, very good. Yep, it's uh, nice. the same. It's on that 42 parallel. Yeah. So you caught that reference yeah. immediately. So let's Steve, move on Steve, to the work. Yeah, yeah, let's move on. But Steve, I want you to weave into the work here uh, something that Joe and I were talking about offline earlier. And Joe's contention is basically the setup for this game. If the Bengals are dinged up at offensive line, what are we going to do to take advantage of it? What's the work either? Leslie F- Leslie Frazier with game planning or individual performances to take advantage of a softer offensive line. Can I can I jump in just to just kind of no I, no the show context. has my name on it. It does have your name, Drew. So just for <laughs> context sake, because Steve, you were talking a second ago about the Dolphins defense and the Dolphins defense. There's a measure of hubris involved in the Dolphins defense, and there's a measure of hubris involved in the Bills defense. And what that hubris is is. I don't care what other teams have done to beat you, our next opponent. We're going to game plan, and we're going to do what we do. So for the Dolphins, it's it's pretty well known, at least this year, you run a zone, a tight zone with a cover two shell, and it limits a lot of Josh's best skills, run a spy, blah, 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 blah. The Dolphins don't care. Single high, zero blitz, whatever. Man, we're going to do what we do, and we're going to beat you our way. The Buffalo Bills do the exact same thing. We don't care what the Niners and we don't care what the Chargers did to the Dolphins to basically emasculate two of Tunga Filoa. We're going to run our nickel four, two out there. We're going to play off coverage. We're going to beat you our way. So that's kind of where this whole thing kind of comes from. So to John's point, like, what do you see this defense doing against 
a very damaged, hurt, right, maligned offensive line of the Bengals this weekend. Well, I, I don't know. It remains to be seen. I think this is – it's unfortunate because this is the exact time of year and the exact situation that you sign a Von Miller for. Um, mm. It's exactly why he was brought in. Um, and, you know, you don't have him. I mean, he's, right. you know, he's right. out with a knee injury. Um, but – this is also why you draft A.J. Epinesa, why you draft Boogie Basham, and why you draft Greg Rousseau. That's why you draft Ed Oliver. That's why you revamp completely your total defensive line roster outside of Ed. You bring in Jaquan, Jaquan Jones, you bring in Jordan Phillips, and you bring in Tim Settle, uh, and you turn those guys loose. This, These are the games that you do that for, and this is a game where those defensive ends – have got to dig deep. They got to win and they got to win now. If the Bills can get quick pressure or even on time pressure with four guys, they win the game. Right. They win I, the I, game. I, I That's agree. the blueprint every game. That's I agree. The blueprint, the yeah. blueprint every now, game. Now, they can do it maybe once in a while, sending five, whatever. But if they start having to send six guys to get pressure, if they start having to, you know, go zero, cover one, zero, zero high safeties, go man and try and get pressure. You know, it's going to be, a, it's going to be a long, can, can a you, long day. Can you as a wide receiver talk to, uh, cause you played wide receiver. That was your role outside of special teams. There was three, there was three instances yesterday that I counted specifically. One of them was the Kair Elam interception where the dolphins went three wide to a side and there was only two bills defenders out there. And then a safety shifted over about 22 yards deep. Does that, when you see that formation, now it worked with Kyrie because Skylar Thompson picked the wrong receiver. He threw it right at Kyrie Elam versus throwing it to the guy that was going to be open. And I know there's some guesswork in that. But when you see that as a wide receiver, hey, there's three of us out here. We got two in front of us and one dude is a mile away. Like, is that, can you just talk about that formation real quick? offensively defensively yachty like can you work us through that yeah you don't know what's going to happen until you get out there and line up right so having a play call that would be perfect against is probably unlikely right because you don't know what's going to happen right if you have automatic adjusts and you make a little eye contact with your quarterback or one of your other co your teammates out there and then you've got these adjustments on you know the adjustments you run those and you and you should be able to get somebody open pretty fast um if it's the down and distance where it's third and 18, it doesn't matter. You still, mm-hmm. somebody's still got to go 18, right? right. So right. they don't care. You can, you can get somebody open right away and throw it five yards. We're going to come up and make the tackle. and It's going right. to be fourth and 12. Right. Um, so all that's in the mix as well. Kai. And I think they, I, I think in the, in this scenario, we're talking about with the Kai interception, I'm thinking, I haven't gone back and looked, I'm thinking it was zone coverage. It was. And they zoned it off. And what happens when that guy came out and turned that corner route and came in front of the safety, they did not have the third guy. They were going to try to get somebody either over the middle or down the seam along with the corner. The problem is the third guy wasn't out in the flat. There was nobody to for Kair to guard short. Right. There was no there was his zone was vacant and there was no Empty. threat. So, so he, he could sloughed float. off. Yeah, yep. he sloughed off, dropped back into the throwing lane after the fact and you know, Skyler didn't know he was going to do that. Mm. Um, he, he didn't have a guy out there to hold him up towards the line of scrimmage, threw it to the guy deep, and the underneath defender, which is Kyer Elam, dropped back in it and just snagged it. It was an easy catch. Yeah. Um, that's what happened, I think, on that play. You've got more offensive players than defensive players. Yeah, you can take it, snap quick, and whip it out there and do a bubble screen and let's go and see if the guy can make one guy miss and get a nice play out of it. Um, you see a lot of teams do that, and that's mm-hmm. always an option. On a down and distance or when you're backed up in your own end, uh, that's us- if you're backed up in your own end, I think that's kind of what I would anticipate doing more of because it's a, a more high percentage throw to complete. The third, you know, the, the one down the field, and that's why the, you know, I, you got to tip your hat to the Dolphins for making the Bills go deep all day. It's a low percentage completion, even if you're going against air. You know, I mean, if you're out there on the practice field and you throw it, it's hard to do that, right? It's hard yeah. to get it. 
So doing it against a defense, it's hard to hit those deep passes. Yeah. yeah. So on, you know, and, and so that's why you know you put three guys over there, you put two defenders over there, and throw the safety over the top late. What you do is you're just trying to. It's not about the receivers and having those guys covered or whatever. What it is about is making the quarterback think you've got this coverage being played, and all of a sudden it's not. Right. right. Got it. Got it. So Skyler Thompson might have thought he had a play there. And then when the safety comes over late, 22 yards deep, what that tells you is those corners, they're not going deep. They're going right. to get underneath. No. They're going to they're right. going to dare you to beat it. They don't care if you try and go deep on them because they got a safety back there for that. Yeah. So they're not going to drop out of there. And can uh, I and that's, can I press you on one more thing offensively? Yeah. No. Uh, so uh, this, uh, this is, this is uh, the over. It, you can you can have a chance. You can it's have not chance. my turn. I mean, I we're getting long in the tooth. We promised we cut <laughs> Steve loose. I, I got. I got. I oh, promise you get a chance. That's it. At, at the rate that this Buffalo Bills defense has seen bubble screens and wide receiver screens work against them, can you why for the life of you figure out why we cannot run a wide receiver screen? Like. Why is can't the run, you can't run everything, Joe. You can't do uh, everything. Why isn't the defense just walking the tape over to the offense and be like, here you go, just do this? <laughs> Here's, I don't know. I can't really speak to the specifics of it, but I have a suspicion. And I think it has something to do with Josh. All right. Um, when you've got a quarterback who can outrun people, mm. you tend to have – things in place to keep him from running if you got like a spy right if you got a spy and he whips it out there that spy don't have to watch josh anymore right so he can just he can just go and that's just the extra defender out there and it's a you know it's a problem um mm -hmm. i think also teams are wary of um uh, just having a an offense that runs like buffalo i think teams with Mobile quarterbacks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think they struggle with that more than teams like Cincinnati mm. and more than teams like Tampa Bay or Dallas. A quarterback that's going to be because an anchor in the pocket. I think a quarterback who can run for some reason, defensive, defensive lineman, whatever, for whatever reason, I think they're just they got their they got their antenna up more for me. I, I it's what I think. I, there may be more specific and more in depth answers than that. Makes sense, but I. I think there's something in the fact that they got a quarterback that can outrun eight defenders mm. on the field. Uh, I think that that makes it hard. It was that way with Dayball too. They tried mm -hmm. to run him. They tried. They you know you've seen him try to run it at times, and they just they stink. Yeah. And some and I thought and John maybe you can talk about this. I thought maybe it was a point where the Bills didn't have either. Their, I thought you know three years ago, like an eighteen when four years ago when Josh was a rookie. 18, maybe a little bit of 19. They didn't have the offensive lineman that could get out in front of them and do anything. They couldn't, they didn't have guys that could do it. Like, hey, hey be careful, Steve, because uh, jo uh, uh, Joe is going to tell you the offensive line is terrible. I was not. But, well, <laughs> but hold on a second. Listen, hold if on you think this Steve offensive line is terrible, go back and look at 2018 offensive line. Right. Yeah. Well, listen, <laughs> you know? hey, be before we miss it, Steve, we do have a super chat from. The lovely and talented Pamadonna Pamela. would like to know. Hey, Steve, Joe, and John. Steve, Just how these. do you how do you think, Steve? How do you think Dorsey is doing? Well, they're they're, they're thirteen and three on the season. 14. 14. 14 and three on the season. Fourteen and four. Well, no, there's they played sixteen games. They're thirteen and three. 13, 13 and three, but fourteen with the playoff yeah. game. Yeah, fourteen with the playoff. Fourteen game, yeah. now, fourteen and three. Yeah, with the playoff game, and <laughs> I, I, I think they're doing really well. And they're scoring. They scored more points this year per game than they did last year. Yes, that's hard to just believe. Just by a hair, I... just by a hair, but still, it it comes out over seventeen games. They scored more games this year than they did last year per game. Uh, I think he's doing fine. Yeah, we're getting a little bit fine. late. We, we 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 told Steve only an hour, but we're pressing against that. So let's uh let's yeah, quit. we we own Steve for at least seven <laughs> more minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I, let's let's press into this Bengals game and just uh what do you think? Just expectations for the Buffalo Bills, knowing kind of what you saw, right? A couple weeks ago, and it, it looked like it was gonna be a 51 to 50 shootout, even though we know that this Bills team is a second half defensive team specifically. 
Uh, what right. do you expect to see from both the Bengals and the Bills in this next game on Sunday? I think it'll be a, I think it'll be a one score game. Wow! At the end of it, nice. Um, I I I would tend to take the over. I think they're going to score sixty points. Um, Together, I do th- combined. Yes, yeah, 30, 30 to 30, 31, 34, 30, something like that. Right. Um, I think that's that's what it's going to take to win this game. I think it's going to be very interesting to see how Cincinnati's offensive line does whether they are healthy enough and able enough to stay in there and give Joe time. If Joe if Joe Burrow has time to throw, the Bengals may win this game. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's going to be the key. The Bills have got to get Joe Burrow running around back there. Their receivers go too – their receiver and quality go too deep for you to go man-to-man against the top three guys mm. and not have somebody open. Yeah. Uh, they're just too good. So you're going to have to zone it off a little bit. But pass pressure is, is paramount. I don't have a problem. I think they're run, the Bills run the ball better than the Bengals do mm-hmm. um, statistically. And certainly Josh is a part of that, but who cares? Because you know what? It if counts. you're the Bengals, yeah, you got to defend it. it. Counts. That's right. You got to defend it. If Josh is running it, it's not like they get to say they didn't let him run and then bring it back because it was a quarterback running. No, it counts. <laughs> I honestly could throw. I honestly could throw up every time everybody says, "Well, without Josh Allen's rushing rushing yards," and I'm like, "Well, they're there. You can't say without him." All right, yeah, I got, I got, I got two questions for you, Steve, and you, you got to settle a bet for me, all right, or, or a beat down. <laughs> and then the other one is just a yes or no. All right, okay. the first the first one is. And I, you know, I know you're a wide receiver, special teams, DB kind of guy, but I contend that there is an immutable fact to pass protection that tackles, given physics, speed, leverage, can only take a guy to nine yards. Uh-oh. And that it's incumbent on quarterbacks to be at eight, eight and a half, seven, seven and a half. Otherwise, danger and i'm saying it when quarterbacks drop too deep right they're they get in trouble because there's no way as an offensive tackle that you can defend against four yards and ten of course of course that's a fact sweet you can't, it's, okay you got an offensive lineman who's backpedaling this guy running forward he can't outrun him for ten he can't outrun him for more than you know even with a two-yard head start which is what you've got about yeah you and with this with this you, belly, I could right. barely get the six. You can't you can't backpedal and pass set that deep faster and than turn the guy him. can run that fast. Yeah, the guy yeah. runs there faster than you can backpedal to get there. So yeah, of course. Yeah, and, for, and for, con- qu- for context, just because one thing that John has done a very good job of with this show, uh, we do film breakdown as well mm-hmm. on on a normal kind of Monday when we don't have a guest. John has done a very good job of educating the average fan of football that doesn't know. So that's something that's never talked about on television. So you see a quarterback get sacked like wildly, like the defensive ends just like merge on the quarterback, and the announcer never says, "Well, he went further than nine yards." Like because they have no well, idea because they're clueless. Yeah. Right. Even well, if Tony Romo does. Coolest. It doesn't matter if it's nine. Doesn't matter if it's nine yards or seven. He's he's got to climb the pocket. Right. He's right. Got to step up in the pocket. You got to feel that. I mean, and yeah, and a little bit of this isn't dictated by. Listen, in our playbook, the quarterback drops back seven yards, and they, you know, you got to take him back. No, you take the you take your pass set, and if the guy's trying to turn the corner, you push him as deep as you can, and you know, and the quarterback's got to be good enough to feel it and hear it. Right. And this, you know, that's why they have ear holes. You can hear those guys working around you. Right. So, yeah, you're right. It's up to the quarterback to step up. And that's why, too, uh, tackles have that kind of ability to run the guy past the quarterback behind him. But it's incumbent on the guards and center to be stout enough not to get pushed back into the quarterback's lap. That's their that's their struggle. Right. right. They got to They got to anchor. And that's, you know, it helps them that there's not less, there's less space in there because there's guards and there's, you know, there's not that much space that helps them, but they've got to be able to anchor. So the quarterback has a place to step up behind them into. So each position has its own issues, but yeah. Yeah. Fina's right. John's right. You you can't, 
Victory <laughs> Monday! Hold on. I, I didn't know that was. Up. I didn't know that was. You know. <laughs> victory lap coming, incoming. Victory lap. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. I didn't know there would be people that disputed that. It's just uh, more about. So what it, we've done. So it's so just the more dyna- about education and learning. The dynamic between John and I has been very good on the show for the last couple of years because I'm a fan. I played a little bit of high school football. I didn't play in college. I didn't play in the pros, right? So I come at from a fan, purely fan aspect. So I'm asking fan questions. And John, as a player, is like, why are you asking that question? Because to you guys, it just makes sense. And to us, it's like, what do you mean he can't drop back further than 10 yards? That doesn't make any sense. It's like, no, that's the rule. (laughs) He can't drop further than nine. That's the rule. Well, yeah, it's like it's a rule, too, that you have to keep breathing. I don't know why you have to write it down, though. Uh, uh, My second question, it's a two-parter real quick before we get to the Super Chat. Uh, Steve, if I come to the game this weekend, will you pretend like you know me and actually cheers me with a if with a he'll be there? Here? He'll be in attendance. Absolutely. You're he'll gonna be, be there. Oh, victory Monday again. <laughs> he'll be in attendance. You've, I'm surprised. You've been in you've been in town a couple of times. I've seen your, your Twitter feed and everything. I never hear from you. Never oh, say hi. Man. You know, like look me, you know, like you know, like reach out to me. Nothing. Well, I, I always felt obviously like I was a big uh, factor. I was a big factor, big mole, you know, big mentor for you when you were a young player. I know. So <laughs> you you actually were. Um, Steve, I, I, I will reach out more. You know, I think everybody leaves the game and, and separates a little bit. But hey, real yeah. quick, I, I know we're keeping it long, Steve. You've been amazing, uh, as I as both of us knew you would. Um, and I can't thank you enough for uh yeah, for no responding worries. to my text, my my 19th text message. Yeah. Um yeah. <laughs> It's like who is this dude? I love you. I don't. I don't. I don't know if James is this. You didn't James get my. California? You didn't get my text. You didn't get my text. Like this is a new phone. Who is this? A new phone. <laughs> who is this? <laughs> who it is? Uh, right. No, I, I'll, guys. I'll come on anytime. It's great. I, I'll come on. I'll, yeah, sure. just ask me. I'm. I got. Yeah, I'm an old guy now. I got lots of free time. In the hey, all, the, all the kids have moved out. Hey, uh, Steve. So listen. Here, here's my quick breakdown on James' question. Thank you for the super chat. Uh, two seventy nine. That must have something to do with Spencer Brown. No, Canada. Uh, oh, Canada. Oh, Canada. Yeah. Is that purple chicken dollars? I mean, is that real money? I don't know. Just oh. get to the question. <laughs> so I, I rate, I rate so hard. <laughs> I, I rate Spencer Brown as a B this year, and I'll tell you why. Number one, and Tasker will remember this. Everybody comes for the Buffalo Bills when they're doing well, just as they do for everybody that's winning. You're getting their best Super Bowl effort every time mm-hmm. they play our club. Mm-hmm. And it's a tough place for him to be. He just came off of, uh, looks like probably a, a decompression surgery in his back. I'm not sure what it is. Maybe a laminectomy, maybe a laminotomy. I don't know. Um, he needs to do a few things. He needs to keep his hips closed and not sexy and wide open and swinging can't give up the corner and the guy is massive he needs to lower his pad level by about three to five inches and he needs to trust his strike Mm. because he's not striking he's placing and the difference is to joe miller's credit about a yard Mm. when you take that guy to seven if you strike him you take him to eight or Mm. if you're taking him to eight you take him to nine you got to affect the angle of the rush Super, yeah, super I would I would go along with you. I think he's a, I think he's a way above average right tackle in the NFL. Now, certainly he's got some strengths. The, the, one of his strengths is the fact the guy's six eight, mm-hmm. and he's got some. He's long, and he's got a good reach. He's mm-hmm. also he's got the right attitude as well. Will Wolford told me one night. Not you may you can you can think about this. Left tackles are genetic freaks. Those guys are different genetically. He's you know they're 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 gifted. They're really gifted. Don't say, don't say that to him. Uh, if you're a right tackle, what you really need to be a good right tackle is a mean streak. <laughs> totally agree. He brings what we need yeah. in that. Yes. Yeah, and that's that's what Spencer Brown is. You, we saw it early on. Now, I'll say this, too. It's his second year. Um, I think there have been de- games when he struggled with certain types of guys, and certain guys have his number or seem to have a better day against him. But I think those guys are getting fewer and far between. I think he's getting better. He's got a ways to go, but I think he has the right mindset. He's going to get better. His third year, I'm looking for. I'm, I look for bigger things from him. But I'm with you, John. There are certain things he needs to do, but they're they're technically above my pay grade. 
I couldn't, you know, the pad level thing. Certainly a guy 6'8", you would think he'd need to drop his pad level a little mm. bit. I see that some as well. Um, it'll be easier for him to anchor. It'll be easier for him to to go lateral. Um, all of that stuff, if he could lower his pad level just a little bit. When you get too tall, you get, you know, you just get too topply, you know. Um, so, yeah, I'm with you. I think he's a, uh, I think he's been a, he's a good draft pick. I think they're right on with him. I think he's going to be plugged in at the right tackle for as long as he can play healthy. And uh, I don't think they'll be saying there in the offseason that they need to replace him. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I know this. There's a ton of guys on this roster. And this has been the way that Brandon Bean has has worked it during their time here. And it's frightening at, at certain times of the year, like coming up in four weeks, hopefully, when, when the Bills go to and win the Super Bowl. Whenever the season's over and you start evaluating, people are going to come to the realization there's about 15 – guys on this roster who really played a lot and contributed who are on one year deals mm -hmm. or in the last year of a two year deal. Yep. Yep. Uh, they got some like, you know, Saffold I think has got one more year on his deal, but yep. there's a ton of guys who are in the last year of their deal or signed a one year deal with the bills. Uh, a lot of them. It was the same story last year. Mm -hmm. This is when, Sean McDermott and the culture and what people say about this team and this town and this franchise and the fan base. That's why they get free agents to come in here and say, I want a piece of that. You got a, yeah. you got a quarterback that's unlike any other gives you a chance. The guy's a monster. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I'll come play for you guys for a year. Give me a one year deal and, and they'll do it. Um, so that is one of the things too. So whether Spencer Brown's good or not, they're still going to have a couple of slots on the offensive line where they're going to have to get some guys in, you know, uh, it'll be interesting to see how they work this roster in the off season. Not we're not there yet, obviously, but Spencer Brown, I think they, I think they're pretty happy with the way he's played. One yeah. last question. And then we're going to get out of here. And I, it's an education question for the fan base. So Steve, you played football in the NFL, obviously, and you started your career uh, without a visor. And then you went to a smoked visor. Uh, there's a lot of players that wear a smoked visor. Ezekiel Elliott is playing right now. He's wearing a smoked visor. Uh, Pre-game, Steph and Josh both wear mirrored visors, but they don't wear them in the game. Can you tell the fans real quick the stipulation behind being allowed to wear a visor, specifically a smoked visor, versus not? Yeah, you got to have a doctor's note, basically. Yeah. I'll write it. You got to have some sort of condition that makes it better. <laughs> yeah, I mean – that's what it takes. I gotcha. I switched and got a, a visor. Mine was a smoke visor. And I also played with a clear visor for a minute too. I got my cornea scratched. Gotcha. That's how it started. Gotcha. Interesting. I got I got my cornea scratched in practice, and I you know I was like Can I, give me something to cover that up. I don't want that to happen again. So that's gotcha. what you know. That's where that came from. And then after a while, I, I stopped wearing it as well at the end of my career. Yeah, it seems like for a running back and a quarterback, exactly. a smoke visor is pays huge dividends. But yeah, so. so. Let me add my my final. Actually, no. I'm I've got. I'm looking at my last. I'm looking at the last helmet I wore, and it does have a visor on it, but it's clear. It clear, clear. So yeah. I, I had a because I got my cornea visor. scratched. Yeah, I, I I had a clear visor on for about three plays. That's about how long it took me to realize that when I engaged with a guy, I was a spitter. So I would yeah. literally just <laughs> spit like my whole visor. Look like uh, Buffalo in July in a downpour. Right, windshield, yeah. I couldn't like see a, a thing. Right? Yeah. I was like, I'll get poked <laughs> in the eye all day long. I can't see <laughs> anything. That is amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. That's Ladies right. and gentlemen, you have been tuned into the Off Tackle with John Fina Show, brought to you by the Market Dominator team on the Buffalo Rumblings Vidcast Network, presented by Picasso's Pizza. My name is Joe Miller. Uh, just super awesome just to be a part of this group and to be on this show with John Fina, with Steve Tasker. Final thoughts, gentlemen. Steve, any final thoughts? No, I'm looking forward to this game. I, I think this is going to be a one-score game. I, I, I hope the weather is great um, so the guys can play and we can see yeah. these two quarterbacks. It's a game that never was. It's going to be 3 o'clock on Sunday, the early window. Um, and... Uh, I think this is a game because of what happened in the Monday night game in the first meeting with DeMar Hamlin. I think you're going to get like six gazillion people watching this game. I was going to ask you, are you um, surprised by that? That it got the three o'clock Sunday slot, not a prime time, not a, no, night that's game? a, that's a, no, that's a monster slot. Oh, is it? Gotcha. Four, the the four twenty five slot on Sunday afternoon is a monster slot. That's the slot of the week. Gotcha. 
Okay. That's why those 425 games on Sunday are big deals. Gotcha. So they go national. And, uh, yeah, there'll be, I don't know, there'll be 50 million people watching that. Nice. I'll tell you yeah. this right now. The Bills establish a running game anyway. Josh Cook or Motor, and they get pressure on Burrow with four. Bills by 10. Yeah, if they don't, I'd say this too. If the Bills don't turn it over like they did, if they, if, if they don't turn it over – they're too hard to beat. Yeah. They're really just too hard to beat. Yeah, I've been, I've been four saying, quarters. They outdistance you. I've been saying for since about week six, the only team in the NFL that can beat the Bills are the Buffalo Bills. It's the only team. I told so, you. I told you they have seen the enemy, and it is them. You know? Yeah, they're their <laughs> own good. worst enemy. They're well, everybody, enemy. ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Buffalo Rumblings, myself, John Fina, Steve Tasker, tomorrow, Jay Spencer King on the Code of Conduct has Levi Wallace. Wednesday in the Hump Day Hotline, Sal Capaccio will be joining us. Uh, Thursday, I believe, the Reed Fer- the the After the Snap podcast with Reed and Blake Ferguson, and then uh, also the Jerry Ostrowski show, the Three Man Rush. So. For myself, for John, for Steve, for all of us here at Buffalo Rumblings, go Bills. Go Bills. Go Go Bills. Bills.